All right, well, welcome everyone. This webinar is hosted by Great Plains Quality Innovation Network, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services Quality Innovation Network Quality Improvement Organization for North Dakota and South Dakota. My name's Crystal Hayes and I serve as the Regional Project Manager for the Great Plains Quality Innovation Network. My colleague, Tammy Wagner, who's also a Quality Improvement Advisor for Great Plains Quality is also here today. And we really wanna welcome you and just thank you for joining us today to discuss the important topic of connecting the dots between antibiotics, immunizations, and sepsis. So before we begin today, there's just a few housekeeping items that we want to review. Today's webinar is being recorded and will, we be, will be posted within one to two days on our website at greatplainsqin.org. All lines will be muted throughout the presentation. Questions and comments can be added to the question chat box and will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Carrie McDermott, um, the communications director for Great Plains Quinn is monitoring the Q&A today. We've added a copy of the presentation, speaker bios, and a list of resources in the handouts tab in the GoToWebinar dashboard. And you'll also be able to access these resources via the dashboard panel on your screen. So let's get started with our webinar, Connecting the Dots, Antibiotics, Immunizations, and Sepsis. So why are we here today? Well, my colleague, Tammy Wagner, and I would like to share with you the importance of understanding the connection between immunizations, antibiotic stewardship, and sepsis. We believe that we can protect one's health, preserve antibiotic effectiveness, and prevent infections leading to sepsis through immunizations, health hygiene, and responsible antibiotic use. We refer to these as the three Ps, protect, preserve, and prevent. So ensuring patients and residents are current on their immunizations and prescribing antibiotics only when needed are ways that we can protect the health of our community. Next slide, please. So we'd like to um, understand who's on our event today. And so if you just please engage with us and let us know uh, through the polling question, what healthcare setting you're associated with. And we'll give you a few minutes to um, log your response. And once we have a few, um, once it seems like those responses have slowed down, then we'll take a look and see who's with us today. All right, so um, it looks like on our um, call today, we've got um, around half of you are from the nursing home setting and about 25% uh, from the hospital and other settings. And then um, also we have some folks um, from the clinics with us. So um, welcome and we're glad you're here today. All right, so let's start out with our objectives. Um, sepsis immunizations and antibiotic stewardship could really easily be their own educational event. Um, but today we're going to focus on making the connection between these important topics by understanding the connection between sepsis, immunizations, and antibiotics. We're going to look at some sepsis data specific to the Dakotas, recognize the role immunizations play in avoiding unnecessary antibiotics, and then review resources that support antibiotic stewardship, sepsis recognition, and immunizations. Next slide, please. All right, so we have another um, poll as we start um, out discussing sepsis. We'd like to know if your organization has or is working on any sepsis outreach and awareness initiatives in your organizations or within your communities. So if you just take a quick minute to respond with a yes, no, or not sure. Okay, so I'll keep the polling open for about 10 more seconds if everybody oh. wants to take a minute and add your comment all right thanks gary i always feel like we should have a little jeopardy music going on at this point all right so um it looks like 28 percent of you have um, already started some work on sepsis um, and then 38 uh, percent 34 percent are either not sure or, or have not so hopefully um, with our um, education event today, um, we'll provide you with some tools and resources that you can either incorporate into what you're already doing, 
or provide you with some um, tools and resources that you can utilize as you start um, working on SEP. Thank you. So I've seen this video several times and the patient and family stories are always very impactful. It always makes me kind of choke up a little bit and get a little teary. Um, because as you can see, anybody can get sepsis, um, anybody can get an infection, including COVID-19, and that could result in sepsis. So we're, you know, the very young, all the way to the very old, those that are healthy and those that are immunocompromised um, are at risk. Sepsis is uh, life-threatening and it's the body's extreme response to an infection. The most frequently identified pathogens that cause infections that develop into sepsis include Staphylococcus aureus, E. coli, and some types of Streptococcus. Sepsis itself is not contagious. However, the infection itself that leads to sepsis could be spread. And some are high, at higher risk for sepsis, so those 65 years of age and older, those with weakened immune systems, chronic medical conditions, severe um, illness that's been recent, or hospitalization, sepsis survivors, and then also children younger than one. Sepsis can quickly lead to tissue damage, organ failure, and death if it goes untreated. So what I'd like you to remember from the sepsis portion of this presentation today is that because sepsis is life-threatening and prompt treatment is needed, early recognition and treatment of sepsis saves lives. Next slide. So the video shared several statistics to sepsis and I've also provided some additional ones on this slide. Um, in a typical year, at least 1.7 million adults in America develop sepsis. Nearly 270,000 Americans die each year as a result of sepsis. And one in three patients who die in a hospital has sepsis. Sepsis or the infection causing sepsis starts outside of the hospital in nearly 87% of the cases. And um, you know it's pretty alarming that only 35% of American adults um, have never heard of sepsis. For every hour that sepsis goes untreated, the risk of death increases by 8%. Sepsis becomes difficult to treat as the patient moves from sepsis to septic shock and their major organs um, are affected. Sepsis is a community issue and it's not just focused on one healthcare setting. Because sepsis starts in the community, it takes the healthcare community as a whole, physician clinics, assisted living, EMS, nursing homes and hospitals to collaborate and prevent sepsis and resulting death. Next slide. Um, sepsis was found to be one of the most expensive conditions in a study done by the Healthcare Cost and Utilization Project in 2013. For all payer sources, treatment of sepsis in the hospital was almost 24,000 or $24 billion. And that's a lot of money. Um, sepsis was the number one condition billed to Medicare and the uninsured. It was the number two condition billed to Medicaid, second only to live births, and it ranked fourth for private insurance. So you might wonder if this cost data from 2013 is still relevant today. Next slide. So currently, sepsis remains the number one or number two reason for admissions and readmissions in the Dakotas. This slide is Medicare Part A claims data from August of 2020 to July of 2021, and it shows the top five DRG bundles for admissions and readmissions um, for both North Dakota and South Dakota. For the Dakotas, the number two reason for admission is sepsis, which is secondary to respiratory infections and inflammation, which would include COVID. In South Dakota, sepsis was the number one readmission DRG bundle, edging out the number two bundle of respiratory infections and inflammations. And in North Dakota, these two DRG bundles were flipped with sepsis as the number two readmission DRG bundle. So the data shows that we have opportunities to recognize and treat infections before they proceed to sepsis, resulting in hospital admission, readmission, and potentially death. Next slide. So as I indicated at the beginning of this presentation, it's important as healthcare providers to help our families, patients, and communities understand the connection between sepsis, antibiotic stewardship, and immunizations. 
And Great Plains Quinn has developed the connecting the dots materials that can be shared with the community to help them recognize the role that they play in protecting their health and preventing infection that can lead to sepsis. This two-sided card um, on this slide helps patients understand the signs and symptoms of sepsis and when to call their provider or seek emergency care. One side of the card helps them to recognize that having an infection along with any of the combination of the following, confusion or disorientation, a fast heart rate, shortness of breath, fever, shivering or feeling cold, extreme pain or discomfort, and or clammy or sweaty skin could mean sepsis. The other side of the card has a stoplight graphic that could be helpful to patients at discharge from the outpatient or inpatient setting, and it provides signs of infection and sepsis at home and the action to take. And it's on a stoplight method where the green light um, means no action is needed, the yellow light um, is to call the healthcare provider, and red to take immediate action as they may have sepsis. And this tool is also available on an eight and a half by 11 um, sheet that we're providing within the um, chat feature and the handouts today. Next slide. So sepsis awareness is critical to early recognition and treatment. Community members and patients um, really need to know the steps to prevent sepsis by preventing infection through an immunization and keeping their wounds clean, only taking antibiotics when needed, and practicing good hygiene like hand washing. If you recall at the beginning of the presentation, we learned that 87% of sepsis starts in the community, and for every hour that sepsis goes untreated, the risk of death increases by 8%. So just like heart attack and stroke, our patients, families, and community members need to be aware of what sepsis is, the signs and symptoms, and the urgent need for treatment if sepsis is suspected. Next slide. So as we close our discussion um, about sepsis today, I am gonna leave you with a quote from Niccoli Machiavelli who wrote in the 16th century, as the physicians say it happens in hectic fever that in the beginning of the malady, it's easy to cure, but difficult to detect. But in the course of time, not having either detected or treated in the beginning, it becomes easy to detect, but difficult to cure. And that is sepsis. Next slide. All right, so as we move into the antibiotic stewardship section of the presentation, um, we're gonna start with another poll um, asking if your organization has implemented the CDC core elements of antibiotic stewardship. Yes, no, or not sure. And Crystal, this is Carrie again. I'll leave it open for another 15 seconds or so. We're about half of our attendees have already voted, so. Right, great. And we just really appreciate everybody's um, actions today to help um, to move through these polls and, and provide your input. All right, I'll, call, I'll probably close it down in about five seconds. All right, thanks, Carrie. All right, wow, this is great um, that 75% of you have implemented um, the CDC core elements of antibiotic stewardship. That is so important. And 25% um, are not sure, so they may have already implemented in their um, organizations as well. So um, I think that's that's a great number. So um, as we move out of the pool here, um, I'm gonna turn the presentation over to Tammy Wagner, and she's gonna start talking about um, antibiotic stewardship portion. Tammy? All right, thank you, Crystal. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I hear you just great. Okay, uh, so now we are gonna just going to discuss antibiotic or antimicrobial resistance. Antibiotic resistance is a naturally occurring process. However, increases in antibiotic resistance are driven by a combination of germs exposed to antibiotics and the spread of those germs and their resistance mechanisms. Antibiotics save lives, but their use can contribute to the development of resistant germs. It's accelerated when the presence of antibiotics pressure bacteria and fungi to adapt. Antibiotics and antifungals kill some germs that cause infections, but they also kill helpful germs that protect our body from infection. The antibiotic resistant germs survive and multiply. 
These surviving germs have resistance traits in their DNA that can spread to other germs. To survive, germs develop defense strategies against antibiotics called resistance mechanisms. DNA tells the germs how to make specific proteins which determine the germ's resistance mechanism. Bacteria and fungi can carry genes from many types of resistance. When already hard to treat germs have the right combination of resistance mechanisms, it can make all antibiotics ineffective, resulting in untreatable infections. Alarmingly, antibiotic resistance germs can share their resistance mechanisms with other germs that have not even been exposed to antibiotics. Organisms resistant to antimicrobial agents can be spread from patient to patient in healthcare facilities, often via the contaminated hands of healthcare personnel, contaminated medical or surgical equipment, or the inanimate uh, hospital or healthcare environment. Antimicrobial resistant infections, medical costs are between $18,000 and $29,000 per patient and the excess length of stay was between six and a half to 12.7 days. So just think of one of your patients or residents who have an antimicrobial resistance organism and how many times they might transfer through the different healthcare settings, their admissions and readmissions. And this is why antibiotic antimicrobial resistance is increasing and why it's important to work on. Now we're going to share some national and state data. From January to May of 2020, antibiotic prescribing decreased substantially in outpatient settings. This is potentially due to a decrease in the spread of non-COVID-19 respiratory diseases such as the common cold, influenza, or due to increased transmission-based precautions in the general population and the changes in outpatient healthcare access. Hospital data shows an increased use of ceftriaxone and azithromycin in 2020, but an overall reduction in the general antibiotic utilization. National nursing home antibiotic data, there was a drastic increase in the use of azithromycin and a small increase of ceftriaxone. It's about the same use for total antibiotic prescriptions in the nursing home setting. And here we have some state-specific data. And in these graphs, you can see the changes over time of outpatient antibiotic prescriptions for all antibiotic classes that were dispensed per 1,000 population in North Dakota and South Dakota compared to the national data. This state-specific data graph shows outpatient antibiotic prescriptions for selected antibiotic classes dispensed per 1,000 population in North Dakota and South Dakota compared to national data in 2020. So as you can see with this uh, slide that North Dakota and South Dakota are not the worst, but not the best, so there's definitely room uh, for improving on antibiotic prescribing. So now, bear with me, I'm going to, um, we have a video for you to watch. It is a TED Talk video that speaks to the history of antibiotics and why we are where we are today. And I hope it sparks something in you as it has in me. I've watched this video a few times uh, on why we need to focus on antimicrobial resistance. This resource, the full video you can view, the link will be in that resource document that has been A. So I, I hope that sparked in you and I hope you are able to go back and watch the video in full because it is extremely interesting and um, uh, really tells you why antimicrobial resistance is important and we need to work on antimicrobial stewardship. So with this, in 2019, a CDC study found that 41% of all Medicare Part D antibiotic prescriptions were prescribed by 10% of all prescribers. This indicates that a small percentage of healthcare providers were responsible for prescribing a large number of antibiotic prescriptions. 
prioritizing higher volume prescribers or that top 10% of antibiotic prescribers by volume for outreach and interventions could result in larger improvements in antibiotic prescribing. Public health and healthcare organizations can use publicly available Medicare Part D prescription data to optimize antibiotic prescribing, to limit the development of antimicrobial or antibiotics resistance and improve patient outcomes. You can help and use these data for action with the CDC's one-page analytic guide on outpatient antibiotic prescription data for peer comparison, audit, and feedback. This one-page analytic guide um, has links to prepare the data set, define the prescriber population, identify higher volume antibiotic prescribers, and how to implement the peer comparison, audit, and feedback stewardship intervention. And the link is also provided in that resource document. So the core elements of antibiotic stewardship, and I know in the poll, a good portion of you have uh, begun your journey, if not uh, well on your way. Um, they have core elements for multiple healthcare settings. So there's the core elements uh, for hospitals, outpatient settings, nurse for nursing homes, there's uh, core elements for antibiotic stewardship at small and critical access hospitals. And there's um, core elements of human anti antibiotic stewardship programs in resource limited settings. There's a plethora of print materials and the Be Antibiotics Aware toolkit that is updated the middle to end of November each year that includes key messages for patients, residents, outpatient healthcare professionals, inpatient long-term care, healthcare professionals, and general messaging about antibiotic resistance. All of these links are also in the resource document. And I'll just say now, instead of keep saying this, all anything that you see that is a link is in the resource document. So these are also uh, resources, uh, additional resources for your organization's efforts. The CDC educates the public and healthcare professionals about improving antibiotic use through a national educational effort, Be Antibiotics Aware. Together with the Get Ahead of Sepsis educational effort, the CDC is promoting the importance of antibiotic stewardship to ensure appropriate and timely antibiotic use in sepsis management. Antibiotics can save lives and are critical tools for treating infections, including those that can lead to sepsis. However, anytime antibiotics are used, they can cause side effects or adverse events such as C. diff infection and contribute to the development of antibiotic or antimicrobial resistance. Also, reducing and eliminating health disparities are critical to building a healthier nation and achieving health equity. Health equity is the attainment of the highest level of health for all people. The root causes of health inequity can be directed Link, directly linked to a failure to address these population level factors. Health disparities are health differences closely linked with social, economic, or environmental disadvantage or other characteristics historically linked to discrimination or exclusion. The quality of antibiotic stewardship programs and activities in locations that may have fewer resources to allocate to stewardship also vary in ways that could exacerbate or create a health disparity. Healthcare providers and other partners focused on improving antibiotic use should explore whether disparities exist in the quality of antibiotic prescribing when planning programs, interventions, and activities. As Crystal showed you with uh, the sepsis uh, tools, we do have also a um, two sheet and one page uh, PDF for antibiotic stewardship that talks about what is antibiotic stewardship and what is resistance with the graphic. And on the other side of the card or on the bottom of the page, you know, when are antibiotics truly needed and has um, the bacteria versus the virus. So these are on the GP Quinn website as well as a link in the resource document. Healthcare providers play an essential role in preventing infections and stopping the spread of germs. 
patients, residents might visit a practice or be in your healthcare setting with an infection or get infections when receiving healthcare in a facility. These are called healthcare associated infections. These infections can be caused by antibiotic resistant pathogens, uh, which may lead to sepsis or death. Follow infection prevention and control guidelines, including screening at-risk populations, ask if recently received care in another facility or traveled to another country, alert receiving facility when transferring a person who is colonized or infected with an antibiotic resistant germ, and educate on ways to prevent spread of germs and infection. Also, stay informed of current outbreaks. Improving antibiotic prescribing, ensure that the person has received the recommended vaccines, and talk to families about preventing infections, keeping their wounds clean, managing chronic conditions, seeking medical care when an infection is not getting any better, and understanding when antibiotics are and are not needed. Antibiotics save lives, we all know that, but anytime they're used, they can cause side effects and lead to antibiotic resistant infections. Be sure to follow clinical and treatment guidelines, implement CDC's core elements, and consider other reasons for respiratory infections that are not responding to antibiotics, and make sure to perform appropriate diagnostic tests to guide the therapy. I'll end our discussion on antimicrobial resistance with this statement from Alexander Fleming, who won the Nobel Prize in 1945 for discovering penicillin. He stated during an interview after receiving the award, the thoughtless person playing with penicillin treatment is morally responsible for the death of the man who succumbs to infection with a penicillin resistant organism. He added, I hope this evil can be averted. So far, we have not yet <laughs> averted that evil, but we can do something now to continue to reduce the issues associated with antimicrobial resistance. So now we are going to take another and final poll question. We would like to know if uh, improving immunization has been a priority in your organization. Tammy, this is Carrie. I'll just chime in and I'll leave it open for about another 15 seconds and give everybody a chance to respond. Okay. Great job. And by the way, one comment came in through the questions panel that that was a fantastic TED talk. And so I guess I'll just reiterate that we will email the link to those videos um, following today's session. Thanks, Carrie. All right, well, this is Crystal again, and it looks like 86% of the organizations have um, improving immunizations as a priority. Um, and it's even between um, the no and not sure of 7%. So it looks like the majority of folks um, you know, have that as a priority. That's great to hear. Good job to all. So finally, we will talk about immunizations or vaccines. America's health rankings and data received from CMS shows influenza and pneumococcal vaccination rates for North Dakota and South Dakota in nursing home and community settings. Again, you can see that there is work to be done, most definitely in the community settings, but kudos to the nursing homes, so great job. In the United States, vaccines have greatly reduced or eliminated many infectious diseases that once routinely killed or harmed infants, children, and adults. However, the viruses and bacteria that cause these diseases still exist. Vaccines are tested and monitored. They go through testing before the Food and Drug Administration licenses them for use. Both the CDC and the FDA continue to track safety of all licensed vaccines. Vaccine side effects are usually mild and go away in a few days. The most common side effects include soreness, redness, or swelling where the shot was given. Severe side effects are rare. Vaccines are one of the safest ways to protect your health. Talk to the physician, have your families, your friends, everyone in the community talk to your, their doctor about vaccines 
and if they should safely receive based on their health or other conditions. Just wanted you to be aware, if you weren't, that the CDC has a um, vaccine app. So the schedule is updated and um, the 2022 uh, adult and ch child vaccine schedules are there. Well, we could not get through this presentation without discussing COVID-19. COVID-19 vaccines have had a lot of misinformation disseminated, disseminated and shared. As healthcare professionals, it's our duty to provide factual and data-driven answers to people's questions about the vaccine. As the vaccine recipient's trusted source of information on vaccines, you all play a role in helping vaccine recipients understand the importance of vaccination and that COVID-19 vaccines are safe and effective. If you haven't heard of um, motivational interviewing, it is a patient-centered communication style used to enhance a person's internal motivation for attitudinal change by exploring and solving inherent ambivalences. It's a guiding style that sits between following or good listening and directing, giving information and advice. It's designed to empower people to change by drawing out their own meaning, their own importance and capacity for change. It is based on a respectful and curious way of being with people that facilitates the natural process of change and honors client autonomy. It's important to note that motivational interviewing requires the clinician to engage with the person as an equal partner and refrain from unsolicited advice, confronting, instructing, directing, or warning. It is not a way to get people to change or a set of techniques to impose on the conversation. Motivational interviewing does take time, practice, and requires self-awareness and discipline from the clinicians. GP Quinn held a learning event about motivational interviewing and a link to that recording will also be shared. Um, this is a screenshot of our immunizations resource, um, the card, and also we have, uh, just as Crystal said, the eight and a half by 11 um, PDF that you can print in, in office, or you can send this out and have it made on cardstock. Um, this one talks about um, really getting your flu shot every year and what vaccines are recommended for those 65 years and older. So here's our fact check. Uh, every year, 2.8 million people get an antibiotic resistant infection and more than 35,000 people die. At least 30% of antibiotic prescriptions are unnecessary, resulting in 47 million excess antibiotic prescriptions per year. Around 50,000 American adults die annually from vaccine preventable infections prior to COVID-19. There's a gap of 17.2 million potentially missed doses of recommended adult vaccines in 2020. And 87% of patients, residents with substance, sepsis had symptoms prior to hospitalization. And again, as Crystal said, that and one in three patients who die in a hospital have sepsis. Finally, we wanna leave you with this quote, collecting the dots, then connecting them, then sharing the connections with those around you. This is how a creating human works, collecting, connecting, and sharing. So we would like to now pause for any questions that might have come in during the presentation that you might have. Move on. Again, this is Carrie, the communications director here at Great Plains Quinn. If you do have a question, um, you can um, pose your questions in the um, panel on your GoToWebinar dashboard that says questions, and um, I can relay them on to Tammy or Crystal. I also can have you click on your name and you can raise your hand in the panel under the attendee tab. And if you do raise your hand, I will unmute you and you can ask the question yourself. 
Uh, I do have a couple questions in the panel now. One was again a comment about the value of that TED Talk. So thank you. Uh, there are three in here right now, so I'll start at the top. Why is it so important to take antibiotics as prescribed by your doctor, even if you feel better after a few doses? Okay, I'll take uh, that one. So even if you're feeling better and symptoms have improved, it doesn't always mean the infection is completely gone in your body. So if a person stops taking the antibiotic prescription too soon, all of the bacteria causing the infection may not be killed and uh, they might become sick again and the remaining bacteria can become resistant to the antibiotic that they've started but not finished taking. Excellent. For that. Thank you. Um, the next question is, uh, there's a couple coming in, so I'm just going to make sure. Is there a link between vaccines and autism? Okay, so per the CDC, no. So scientific studies and reviews continue to show um, no relationship between vaccines and autism. I think some people have suggested um, that, uh, I can't even say it, thimerosal, it's a compound that contains mercury that's in vaccines given to infants and young children might have something to do with autism, but others have suggested that the MMR, measles, mumps, rubella vaccine may be linked to autism, but numerous scientists and researchers have studied this and they continue to study the MMR vaccine and thimerosal and they always reach the same conclusion that there is no link between the vaccine or thimerosal and autism. Awesome, thank you, Tammy. Uh, the next question, hopefully I get this right. Any education I could give our facility FNP, uh, okay, I'm gonna start over. Any education I could give our facility FNP regarding post-antibiotic urine culture collections. Oftentimes we are having repeat antibiotic usage after the post-antibiotic culture is taken. I can, I can, I can take this too. There, there is, um, we don't have those in our handouts, although I think in one of the links there is some information um, when it, it talks about the urine cultures. So in, in that elderly population, um, even that initial, you know, four plus bacteria, Luke estrace, a little bit of blood, they really have to be looking at more symptoms. And I know many of you in the nursing homes, you send the, the resident to the ER and uh, some education needs to happen there too with the practitioners. So your um, family nurse practitioner there um, if you want to give Carrie your um, email address there in the comments, we can sure send you some information specific to that. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, thank you. Emily, I got her email, so I will, um, or Emily, yeah, if you can add it, I'll make sure we follow up with you on that. All right, let me go through um, another comment about the TED Talk being very good, as was all the content um, on the webinar. And then we have one more question. Um, how can we prevent sepsis? Okay, I'll take that question. That's a great question. Um, you know, since sepsis is a result of an infection, um, we really just need to take those steps to prevent infection. And then if we have an infection, we really want to treat it seriously. Um, and so, you know, some of the things that we can do as healthcare providers um, to prevent infection are those great infection control practices like washing our hands, um, making sure that we're using sterile technique if we're um, doing any invasive procedure like, you know, inserting a urinary catheter or a, or a um, intravenous catheter, um, those types of things. Um, but also um, helping our patients to, and our families and our communities to know that, you know, if they're, they have an infection, if they're taking antibiotics, um, you know, they need to um, complete the course of the medication, taking it as prescribed. 
um, you know, also just um, being sure that they're immunized, making sure they get their vaccination so that they can avoid um, that risk um, of contracting an infection. Um, and just, you know, being aware of the sepsis um, signs and symptoms so that, you know, if they aren't getting better um, or if they have those um, signs of sepsis, then that they, um, you know, get medical treatment, um, hopefully before they uh, begin to uh, move into that area of septic shock, um, you know, which involves the organ failure and then uh, potentially death. So, you know, just, um, you know, continuing to practice good infection control practices and encouraging our um, family members and communities to practice good um, hygiene and good um, infection control practices as well. All right, this is Carrie again, and I do not see any additional questions in the questions panel. Um, and just a reminder, if you want to ask a question, you can type it into the question panel on your dashboard or go into the attendee tab and you can raise your hand um, and we'll be notified that you need your line to be unmuted. Yeah, well, some questions are in there. We just want to thank you for attending. And always, you can visit our website at greatplainsquin.org. Um, we appreciate all your participation in the polls today. And we hope you found that the information was valuable and applicable. And please, um, when Carrie finalizes or wraps things up, take a moment, um, offer feedback on this LAN event uh, and evaluation and help us ensure that we're meeting your needs in our educational offerings. And we always value your feed, feedback and input. And uh, we just so appreciate your time and participation because we know how very busy you all are. Any questions came in? No additional questions, just a couple of comments that it was an excellent webinar. So great job. Great, thank you all. Carrie, and I guess. I was just going to say, I can, I can um, also relay my thanks both to you, Crystal, and Tammy for an excellent presentation. Um, I, I've i probably heard this um, three to four times in the last two weeks, and I've learned something each time, and greatly appreciate your knowledge and your expertise um, and taking the time to teach all of us. Uh, and I just want to remind everyone that when you close out of today's webinar, you will get dropped off at an evaluation. I know um, that was just mentioned, but that is really important for us to get feedback from you so we can plan um, future educational activities. And um, Crystal or Tamara, is there anything else you want to relay? No, I just want to thank everybody for you know all the work that they do. I know it's um, been a challenging um, time over the last two years and, and just really appreciate um, the work that you do. I will add one more thing. If, if you're inquiring about continuing education, Great Plains Quinn is an approved provider of continuing education with the North Dakota Board of Examiners for Nursing Home Administrators and the South Dakota Board of Nursing Facility Administrators. And later today or early tomorrow, I will send all attendees um, the links to uh, the videos that we shared today, the handout with the, the full list of resources um, and a copy of the presentation and recording, et cetera. And with that, there'll be a certificate of attendance um, and you can submit it to your accrediting body.